Hey, everybody. Um, welcome, and thanks for coming. Um, my name is David Kincannon. I'm a partner here at Oric, and um, as you probably know, Oric is a global law firm with um, a bunch of lawyers, in our case, around um, 1,300 or so. Um, we have a big practice representing technology companies in Silicon Valley, here in New York, and through our European and, and Asian offices as well. Um, one of the things we like to do uh, to sort of enable the technology community here in New York is to put together events like this, you know, fireside chats, panel discussions like today, pitch, pitch contests, demos, um, basically just to gather people around to get some information and insight from people that practice sort of in the New York tech economy. Um, it's sort of directed at entrepreneurs. So I guess I have one question right now. How many people here are entrepreneurs or working on starting a company? That's great. Uh, totally commend that. And, and wonderful that you're doing that. Wonderful that you're doing it here in New York uh, and that you've joined us this evening. So we've got a really good panel. Uh, we've got people who are working in finance and operations at some of New York's very successful um, tech companies. And I was going to ask them to just introduce themselves, uh, give their name and title of the company they're with, and a little bit of their background, and then we'll get right into the uh, panel. Hi, uh, I'm Brian Cohen. I'm new to New York. I just moved here about eight weeks ago. Uh, it's great to be here. If I tell you where I joined, where I came from, I don't know if you'd welcome me as openly. Boston. Boston. Yes, thank you. <laughs> you weren't arrested right, in front of the right. NFL's headquarters yesterday, were you? Um, <laughs> I, I'm delighted to be here. Um, I, I'm at DigitalOcean. I would describe myself as a serial CFO. I don't know if that was intentional or not, but I've been CFO of technology companies for probably the last 25 years. Started out at PwC, and um, I just love finding great companies that are growing rapidly and help take them to the next level. So I've been with uh, companies. One was a public company that was, was acquired by Cisco, a private company that was acquired by Cisco. Um, I, other companies have been acquired by IBM, VMware, et cetera. That's not really important. What's important is it's, be, it's great being part of a great team and helping build a great company. And, um, and it's just a, a journey, and you should enjoy it every day. Hi, I'm Beth Ferreira. I'm currently at a company called Spring, which is a a mobile marketplace in the fashion and also most known for fashion, but we're also in other categories like lifestyle and home. Um, prior to that, I ran operations at Fab and Etsy. And similarly, I've looked for companies that are growing um, and sort of in thinking about or trying to tackle the retail space in a completely different way. Uh, great, hey guys, uh, Rob Purdue, CEO of the Trade Desk. Uh, I've been there about two and a half years. Uh, I own the, the global p and and all the business operations or business uh, uh, team. Uh, prior to that, uh, I was also the CEO of uh, what we now call a managed service uh, uh, a technology company called iWonder, which was a rich media ad serving company. Uh, took that to about uh, 400 people in 25 countries around the world, sold it to our larger competitor, uh, MediaMind, which is a, a public company, uh, and then prior to that uh, was an investment banker uh, buying, helping, uh, advising folks like yourselves in capital raising uh, in digital media and ad technology uh, prior to that. So. Hey everyone, I'm Amy Wu. I'm at NewsCred. Um, so NewsCred, we're a uh, N10 content marketing solution. We work with large uh, Fortune 2000 companies and help them essentially become publishers, help them source, license content, create content, and also plan and publish on our software platform. Um, so um, unlike these guys, I'm a first time operator. So I run our finance and operations teams uh, at NewsCred. And prior to that, um, I was in venture capital um, at two different funds, first at Insight Venture Partners, and uh, which is a very late stage growth fund, and then at IA Ventures, which is an um, early stage fund. Tonight's session is supposed to be about operations and scaling operations at growing technology companies. All of these folks are working at you know, great examples of, of high growth tech companies. Um, we'd love to keep it pretty informal, so if you, if you have a question, a burning question, we'll try and, we'll try and call on you and get a mic to you so that uh, you can ask it during the course of this. But uh, we'll sort of kick it off with, uh, I guess the first question that you would have is, if you think of a, a company, started, they all sort of start the same with a, you know, a, 
a couple founders, a few founders, maybe a single founder, um, where everybody's doing everything or everybody's doing whatever it is that they can do and there isn't a separate person who's designated with a title like a VP of ops or a CFO or uh, a COO. So, you know, and, and I'd throw this out to, to any of the panelists. When do you know uh, or why do you know that it's time, you know, uh, for your business to get someone who's truly in a role of, of overseeing operations independent from other core functions like tech or you know, finance. It, interestingly enough, I'll start is we're the ones that are called. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> these guys probably, uh, uh, they're the ones that make the call, the, uh, the founder uh, uh, entrepreneurs. But a couple of perspectives might be you're, you're, you've got revenue, you built product, uh, you, you're starting to grow beyond that core team. Uh, and one of the things I've talked to a lot of founders about is uh, as you start to think about scaling the business and thinking about what the opportunity is, uh, uh, what are you good at? Where, you, you know, you're trying to do everything. You get to a point in, in every business that scales quickly where you can't do it all. You want to, uh, uh, but you can't touch everything and you can't devote enough time uh, to everything that you want to. And so at least when I think about COO, uh, you need a partner who compliments you. So what are you really strong at? Where can you be the, have the most effect on scaling uh, uh, the business? You built the business or started the business because you've seen white space, uh, you're, you see something that's disruptive, you want to drive that strategy, you want to change the world in some manner. Uh, oftentimes, you need a partner to help bring that to life. And so uh, I'd say uh, oftentimes that's when a COO comes into, into play, at least from my experience. Um, <clears throat> from the companies that I've, I've looked at that either are looking for a COO or are thinking about a COO, I think there are three key reasons to bring a COO on. One is you're just, growing rap you're just growing really fast. And so you just need more hands on deck to sort of manage that growth and really understand and start to make really good decisions about what you're doing. Um, two, you're starting to get, you're getting either you're, this is probably not great for this group, but you're either bi too big, right? So you start, start to need to separate responsibilities and the, the span of control is getting way too big for the CEO. And then the third piece, which I think is a little bit um, more nuanced, is if, you, if it's a company that needs a very specialized skill, um, such as this is really a sales driven business, but the CEO is not super sales driven. Maybe you get a sales e COO or, you know, the same for the marketing vertical or whatever. And those are the, probably the three um, core reasons too. I think there are definitely reasons. I think there's a lot of crutch reasons to bring in a CEO. So, um, I, we don't know what we're doing. Um, and I think that's really tough. I think you need to start thinking about, um, what are the vertical expertise you need to figure out those problems versus a general sort of COO that's going to take something to the next level? Yeah, well, it's it, it, it sort of your last point sounded like it was the whole grown up supervision. We've got a bunch of people who are all sort of vision types or, you know, I, I call them butterflies and operators. Right. So it's a bunch of butterflies that that succeed and succeed rapidly. And, and obviously, the idea to have someone who can have an operating role in, in, in a, an early stage or even a later stage company assumes that there's been some success in, in adoption of whatever it is that you're doing, your product or service. Um, Brian, as you were saying, you've been in a lot of these places, a lot of different places. Did you ever feel like you were brought in as kind of just the adult supervision? And if, if so, you know, does that, does that come with some pitfalls? Well, or? I would never admit that and specifically name any companies. But oftentimes, <laughs> the, the, it's the board. Yeah, don't check his LinkedIn. <laughs> <laughs> we do want people to share anecdotes, but it's going to be hard. So oftentimes, boards will contact you. So they're... I give entrepreneurs great credit. I could never start a company. I could never come up with an idea. It's just not what I do. And once you get to the point where you've got a great idea, you've raised your initial round of capital, the expectations ramp significantly. And oftentimes, investors want someone who's, who has experience, who's dealt with institutional investors or venture investors, someone who's helped scale a company, someone who understands systems. Um, and and I wouldn't call it adult supervision, but at the end of the day, they're looking for someone who can really be a strong partner to the CEO and to the management team and take the company to the next level because starting the company is hard. Executing is probably even more difficult. 
And if you've got a great company, make sure you, you have a great team and, and take full advantage of uh, the opportunity by executing. Yeah. Well, one, one of the things we're doing, we're throwing around some terms like CFO, COO, VP of Ops, or whatever. And a Amy, you've, you've got dual titles uh, mm -hmm. in news cred, so you're VP of Ops and you're a CFO. How do you, how do you see those various titles being broken down, and, and, and how do they apply to the roles that you fill at news cred? Yeah, I think... Um as any of these guys would probably um, agree with me, is that COO means something very different. COO and actually CFO means something very different at different companies. Um, there's a lot of overlapping uh, functions that they can have. You know, some sometimes the COO is, and, and it, this boils down to sort of what are the what what are those complementary skill sets to the CEO. Um, a lot of times, COOs are um, run you know client services, um, operations, facilities, HR. Sometimes. CFOs run, you know, HR, legal, finance, et cetera. And so it really depends on how I think the company um, evolves over time and sort of like the strengths of the executive teams and where there are holes and where people have really grown with the company um, that you, and at, at every point, it's like less about the title and more about what are the gaps in your executive team. So, um, uh, so at NewsCred specifically for me, I joined um, running operations, and um, and for for NewsCred, what that means is um, is is actually uh, owning essentially being a source of truth to all metrics and goals for the company. So I help work with all I, I help work with all execs in setting their OKRs and their KPIs essentially, and then holding them to it, um, and then reporting on you know whether teams are performing or not performing. Um, gradually, the role expanded to including finance as well. Um, I brought on a controller, and so he's my partner in managing accounting. Um, and then we work together on a lot of the FP&A side of finance, and then the, there's the operations side. So um, it really depends on, I think every company is very different. Yeah, but so it, <clears throat> I mean, it includes things like, you know, I don't know, leases or, yeah. you know, if you're doing... Yeah, facilities. You know, yeah, yeah, exactly. Right, or... Um, you know, capital equipment, leasing. Mm -hmm. And uh, when when you do that, do you see your role as essentially taking things like, like for example, at NewsCred, how was that being handled before? Who was doing that before there was a des designated person? Because you know that oh, somebody, yeah. the day you showed up, said, ah, I've got a stack of stuff. Come to my office. I'm handing it to you. Yeah. Um, so before we did have, um, we had another CFO, and he just essentially did like everything, um, including facilities. And, um, I, and I was just just to add to that fact in your original question, I think a lot of people talked about sort of like a gut feel about when you need a COO, um, just from a very high level. Like what I typically saw on um, in the investor side was around like when you're when you're like under ten people, you likely do not need a CEO. In fact, usually what that is is co CEOs and two founders who both are like business minded and um, and so it's like you know there's C so a CEO as a um, under ten actually is oftentimes like a red flag for investors. Is like who is ultimately the decision maker here at this company. Then when you're like around 20, um, you have usually someone who's like kind of jack of all trades. And so our CFO, um, before he, he um, left, he did he did that. He was like jack of all trades at HR, finance, you know, ops. He did everything um, and, until we were about um, 100 people when I joined. And then there was so much work that we then split a lot of the roles, um, finance, operations. And then after I took over both, we essentially, I essentially hired people under my team to help me manage. So in, in those discrete areas are, you were saying, so, so it's finance, part of it's finance, part of it's mm -hmm. HR. Uh, we have a head of HR um, who uh, reports directly to the CEO, so um, who's, who handles that separately. But in other companies, I think HR oftentimes falls under the CFO or the CEO. So if we look at the ways in which, and that, that sort of, you know, news cred story, or, you know, I invite other folks like, and Beth, how long have you been at Spring? That, that's a pretty, Spring A is a pretty new company. It's a pretty new company. So I've been there a little over a year. Yeah. Um, we launched in August. Um, but yeah, I mean, I agree with you. I mean, you know, my role at Etsy versus Fab was night and day. Um, you know, Etsy, my title was VP of Ops and Finance, and I ran everything except except engineering, so including product. Um, and then at Fab, I ran the entire, entire supply chain, which was all physical goods, which was completely different than what the original role was. Um, so that was, you know, from 
from buying to when something got to someone's doorstep. So, you know, that wasn't fine. You know, that wasn't finance. That wasn't HR. That wasn't, it was like, okay, we got warehouses and things moving. So, um, yeah, I agree with you. It's like dramatically different depending on the situation. So at spring, what, what at type spring of and spring. It? So, um, you know, right now I'm interim. So, you know, I've been, uh, and per- purposely so for me, um, I've been helping to hire across the team. Like we've been growing really fast. So, um, you know, we went from a couple people less than a year to get, a year ago to almost 50 right now. So also thinking about, um, you know, how we do marketing, how we, how we think about how do we work with our brands? So our brands, we don't touch product there. So, so similar to Etsy as a true marketplace. Um, and what we're, you know, what kinds of restrictions we put in, what kinds of things that we want our, um, the, the value prop for our customers coming on the platform. So things like, do we want, you know, do we want to have universal return policies across all, all brands? And like, how would we execute those things? Um, and just a lot of thinking about scaling. So like, how do we prepare the organization as we believe that we're going to be a couple hundred people in, you know, not so long from now, like, what do we need to do to make that to have, you know, there's always growing pains, but like the least amount of growing pains. So, you know, what are the types of roles we need to bring in? Like, when do we bring someone to run it, run HR? Uh, you know, the, how do we keep the culture? So, you know, culture is super important to us. Um, I'm trying to think of what else is sort of top of mind. You know, how do we just do like the sheer recruiting? Like we do, you know, we need to do a fair amount on the engineering side, but also the rest of the organization. And how do we introduce those people into the company in a way that, you know, it's not the old guard versus the new guard or, you know, this group versus that group. Um, so those are the kinds of things that um, I spend a lot of time thinking about and working with the team on. Yeah. And that's all a, it makes perfect sense, particularly at sort of the part of the growth curve where yeah. where you find yourself now. Brian haven't been through a bunch at all levels, um, and and focusing particularly, I guess, on finance, but sort of those related areas, right? What are some of the biggest pain points you've seen when you're scaling? Um, you know, is it oh gosh, you know, we started off using QuickBooks and now I'm here and I have to, you know, get a real accounting system or. What, just what are some of them? Well, that's that's typically one on the list. It's you find out that you just hired someone in Australia and we are expanding globally and you weren't even aware of it. Um, I, I think a lot of it is making sure it's amazing how many companies don't have a strategy process. And a strategy process doesn't mean that you have to sit down for weeks and prepare books on what your strategy is, but it's just getting the key people in the company together and going through and making sure you have a common understanding. What's your mission? What's your go-to-market strategy? It's what, what are you, you know, a SWOT analysis. What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? And, it, and if you have weaknesses, it's not just listing them on the board saying, okay, we've got all these weaknesses. It's getting down to what's the root cause of those weaknesses. Because if you've got weaknesses, it's going to inhibit your ability to grow and be successful. And you need to get to the bottom of why those are weaknesses and eradicate them. And you have to be aware you can't live in a cocoon. You need to be aware of threats to your business. What if someone else comes out and they sell whatever you're selling cheaper? Uh, So I think the strategy process is is really critical. But ultimately, I think every business comes down to people. And it's retaining great people. It's dealing with people who maybe weren't the people you thought they were when you hired them. Uh, do you do you somehow find a way to park company? How do you recruit? Uh, it, it's a there's a war for talent, and if you can't hire fast enough, you're not going to be able to scale your business. So hiring is extremely important, and it's communicating with your investors. At the end of the day, I kind of look at them as oh, no one takes us the wrong way, but they're kind of your parents. They gave you the money, and they expect you to take that money and put it to good use and and grow that company. And you just can't take the money and ignore them. You need to communicate with them. And I think there's a style and a way to doing that. There's a way to run a board meeting. And ultimately, it's, you know, I heard, I know the word adult supervision or the words adult supervision, but it's building trust. I think building trust with your investors is extremely important. And it's not just with your investors. It's with your employees. It's everyone you touch. 
And business can be really complex or it can be really simple. And if you do the simple things really well, I think you'll take care of the complex things along the way. One of the things you referred to is, is one of the things that I find. So, uh, for, for example, for the trade desk for Rob, uh, I think you were saying you had 240 employees. Yeah, just I think 250 as of tomorrow. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So you, you have hired fast. Yeah. Uh, so, w w yeah, what was the growth curve for that? So how did you get, where were you a couple of years ago? Yeah, I, I joined uh, New Year's Eve 2012. So it's been just about two and a half years, and we were 25 people when I joined. So we've, we've 10x that and, of course, more than 10x revenue and all that. So... Uh, when I was there, 25 people, we had three offices, uh, one in California, one small one here in New York, and, and a very tiny one in Colorado. And, you know, as, hey, this is the right product, the right strategy, the right team. Uh, the world deserves to know about this. <laughs> this kind of, obviously, I'm biased, but uh, uh, this, this is a company that, that, that's got a chance to be a real global platform. And so I was brought in to scale the business. So very quickly... Uh, we've got into uh, 15 offices in eight markets around the world. So the, the hardest part, and you, you touched on it, is uh, time zones. Uh, I'm talking to people in Tokyo at 10 o'clock at night, and uh, I usually start my morning with Europe from 8 to 11. From 11 to 2, it's East Coast. From 2 to 5, it's West Coast. And from 5 until whenever, it's Asia. And uh, uh, one, of the, one of the hardest things about that kind of rapid growth, you guys both touched on it, is first... When I got there with 25 people, there was really one manager in the company. It was, it was very flat, uh, super high amount of trust among all the team members. How do you go from that? Uh, and we, we consider culture our, our most important uh, element. Jeff and I will always own the culture. We don't have an HR uh, department because we, we won't outsource our culture to anyone else. Um, how do you inject that culture and maintain it well, as well, you grow? Well, how did you do it at the trade desk? So well, how, did you, how did you get from 25 to 50? You're on a lot of planes, uh, and the central element is trust. I mean, uh, um, I built, if you will, you want to call it built uh, or grown 30 managers in the last two years, and oftentimes they were first-time managers. And uh, <laughs> then uh, uh, entrusting them or... or uh, uh, having them own, hey, you're now a cultural ambassador, right? Like uh, Jeff and myself and the two other uh, uh, folks that run the global business, we can't be everywhere. We can't talk to everyone. A big part, you believed in what, what we said our culture is about, what our values are, how we go to market, how we deliver services. Now you've got to inject that in the next 100 people. And then there were a core of 50 people, and those 50 people have helped us with the next 100 people that we've hired in, in the last six months. So... Um, that, that's a big part of it. Uh, I could go on for an hour, but it's definitely culture. It's definitely trust. It's definitely thinking 12 months out, like what does the org chart need to look like? How fast or how much can I grow people internally? So who can I move up that org chart as we scale? Who do I need to go out outside? There's just a different skill set uh, uh, that we need to bring in. How do you introduce those folks into the org so there's not an us versus them uh, um, uh, mentality? Um, all of those things are things you're thinking about all the time. In addition to managing the board and managing uh, uh, rapid growth, one of the, the biggest things that is a risk in any business that is servicing uh, rapid growth is, hey, the P&L looks great, but the cash flow, right? You, your working capital is, is a different story. They, so. they get to, yeah, they, you're jumping ahead, but here's a great one, right? I mean, how do you feel in the operating roles that you guys see yourself? Um, obviously, a CEO you know, has a bunch of responsibilities, but um, among them, you know, Fred Wilson, I think, did a blog post not that long ago saying, well, what, you know, your first, your first, like, business objective is don't run out of money, right? right? So as, as a COO or a CFO, um, you know, in theory, you're, you're reporting to a CEO who actually, if he or she is paying attention to one thing, it should be that one thing. But uh, do you have a special responsibility and how do, how do you deal with that? I'd get, be interested in hearing insights on that. Or. Yeah, so um, I definitely think uh, cash uh, is like one of my biggest priorities in terms of protection at, at the company. You know, NewsCred, just like a lot of other companies, is very fast growth, um, high burn SaaS company. And as a result, um, you know, we, uh, you know, I, it's like very, you have to be very, very careful around like, budgeting every single year um, 
And then you know, what is your cash out date? Because you're you're having to model out cash out. Your cash out could be like anywhere from like 12 to 18 months, depending on many different factors um, that are all very volatile. And so um, and so it's it's extremely top of mind for me. And I see that as my job to both inform the board and also my CEO of um, of you know how how does that look for us? What's the health look like? And you know when we get in a situation where either external markets um, are, are looking you know shaky or you know there's something operationally that we had to fix internally then all of a sudden it's around um, I am responsible for saying okay we need to cut back our burn in order to conserve conserve this cash and here are all the reasons why and I think one of the hardest um, hardest parts of my job at newscred um, running finance and ops is like um, is that you know my my customer is newscred whereas a lot of our other execs their customers are you know, fortune to that, you know, our actual customers. And so I'm the one who will, who will be giving tough love saying, no, you really can't do that. You can't do like eight, five of these things that you just wanted to do um, because we don't have the capital to do all of them. And so then it's like, let's all discuss like, what is the biggest impact, you know, initiatives to actually do. So a lot of prioritization, um, you know, helping execs think through how to prioritize all their projects is um, part of my job. And so, um, and because I'm oftentimes the no man or no woman of the company is like, it's, you have to build that trust um, between yourself and your execs and the CEO and the board. And it's always, you know, attention at play. Well, and to your point, I guess in some ways, <clears throat> you think of, you know, operations generally as being sort of a cost center and, and other areas is being, you know, uh, uh, certain of them cost centers, but others of them sort of revenue centers. And are, are there lots of ways that you think you can favorably affect the, sort of the angle I would say you were coming at it from was, bur you know, burn and, and conserving cash. But there are sometimes other ways in which you can uh, you can extend your, your, your runway in other ways. I mean, so I'd be interested to hear if other people have had experiences sort of, you know, driving revenues through ops or, you know, other, you know, types of cost savings or how they perceive that. Sure. I mean, you know, when I look at, you know, some of the example, some of the companies that I've worked at, there's, you know, there's, there's just a general cost to doing business. And so when you're sort of early stage, I don't want to say you're faking it before you make it, but you're sort of throwing bodies until you have the systems or whatever. And so, you know, I looked at it as like every month we needed to move towards something better. So, you know, we had our KPIs and these are the things that we're going to move. And every month we're going to measure, you know, are we cutting costs or becoming more efficient on these metrics? So, you know, we'll take we'll take, you know, the fab example where we're actually moving product and we you know quickly open warehouses. You know, we threw people at that and we you know built our own systems. And as we got, you know, as we as the months went on and built more modules about how to, you know, how to do those kinds of things more efficiently, you know, we drop costs dramatically. And so it's it's a difficult it's a potentially difficult place in the business because you are a cost center and so i think the measurement and the opportunity is usually things are i don't want to say broken but not as efficient as they need to be in the early stages so you have this like runway so it's easier to show progress you know as, as you get bigger and more effective that becomes a little bit more challenging but that you're constantly measuring against that so um that's one that's one piece and then two is just you know, managing headcount. So, I mean, the biggest, I mean, most, these com most of our companies are 80% of our costs are headcount, um, really understanding who we're hiring and when. And that's across the entire business. And I feel like, you know, even in roles where I wasn't managing finance and, you know, I grew up working for Fred Wilson at Flatiron Partners. So, you know, cash is definitely king. Um, you know, we... I think it's everyone's responsibility, for, on the, particularly on the exec team, to be very cognizant of that and really um, understanding why we're bringing some on, someone on. And then also, these companies are general. You know, if your company is growing really fast, you also be very real about who you have on the team and evaluating whether or not it makes sense that they still remain on the team. And so, are we doing a good job of coaching them to the next level of where they need to go, or if? For whatever reason, they can't get to that next level. Is there another role, or do we need to transition them out in some way? So, um, 
that's really hard for young companies to do. But it's, you know, particularly when you're going from, you know, in the step function between 10 to 20 and 20 to 50 and 50 to 100, 100 to 250, these are huge step functions. And so, and each one of those are a big transition. And I think that's where, I think that's where, um, you know, managers trip up and that's when it needs, that's when it becomes really helpful to have someone who's seen the story before. So, um, and thinking about how to evaluate those things. So you made a point when we were talking about cash and it's, it's interesting in earlier stage companies where you start the company, you own 100% of the cap table and you get to a point where you're going, okay, begrudgingly, I think I have to raise money. And oftentimes it's, I've got, like, I don't even know if I can pay the other two employees this week. So finally, you begrudgingly agree to go out and raise money. And oftentimes people underestimate how much cash it's going to take. I don't know too many companies who just raise a Series A and then ultimately get to an IPO or a great liquidity event. And if you don't have cash, you can't run your business. So would you rather own 100% of you know, a small company or say 10% of a much larger valuable company. And the most important thing is try to really understand what your needs are gonna be. And don't focus so much on the dilution, focus on the goal. And the goal is to build a great company. And to build a great company, sometimes you have to do things that you really are not totally comfortable with, but ultimately it's the right decision. And raise, the, raise more than you need, Raise it when you don't need it. Don't let anyone, don't wait until you're totally desperate. When everyone knows you're desperate, they're going to give you term sheets that are, that are not going to be as exciting. And once you have the cash, manage it like it's your last dollar. And always, if you're, once you have venture capitalists in your company, every single board meeting, have a graph and show how much cash you have and based upon your projections, where's it going? And... You, you can't ignore cash. It's the, if you have cash, you can fix anything. If you don't have cash, game's over. Well, that's that's a great that's a great point. I've had I've had board meetings. You know, I'm thinking one a couple of weeks ago where there was a long discussion around um, different growth scenarios and the cost of different growth scenarios and you know the staging of you know needs for capital and what what it would do to take an aggressive path or. <clears throat> a less aggressive path and, and how they could do it with the, the amount of financing they had and whether they'd need to get more. And this is a company that just, you know, had a very successful raise pretty recently. But they're always, uh, you know, always uh, kind of, you know, managing a, uh, the car with an eye on the gas needle, right? Um, sort of how you look at it. When you think about that, so that's that's one of the things that is, as you say, should always be, that that's a, those are a set of metrics that are tied together that are should be presented at every board meeting. What are some of the other ways in which, uh, you know, as as ops professionals, you, you you know you you try to manage the information flow to the board, or how do you see your function in terms of, you know, do you directly liaise? And, and this is just directed to anybody, but you know, are you always at those board meetings? Generally, at those board meetings, are you preparing most of the stuff? If you are, what kind of stuff is it? What is it about? Is it about oh, hey, we're going to switch over? You know, if, if you're switching, um, you know, one of your big software vendors, is that important to them? If you're if you're buying some capital equipment, is that important? If you're doing equipment leasing, is that important? You know, what what are some of the things that are sort of typical, um, in how you interact with your board? My it might be a, a little different. I'm, I'm I'm actually on the board, uh, and because I own the global PNL, I'm responsible for revenue and cost. And so, uh, there was a, a you know the seminal conversation when I was about to to join the company. And, you know, companies growing like this. And Jeff said, you know, Jeff's the founder and CEO said, hey, we can do this. And we both agreed philosophically, we can bend the revenue curve way up and to the right. Uh, I said, hey, you know, as we start to think about managing costs in, in that environment, one of the hardest things to do is when you're maximizing growth uh, is to manage the growth. Right. So there's all the costs that, that, that we've been talking about. <coughs> and uh, uh, we agreed uh, from before I started, hey, we're, we're going to be profitable. We're going to do this and maximize growth, but we're going to do it profitably. And we've been profitable for over three years. And when we first talked about it, I said, Jeff, that's one of the hardest things in the world to do is to do this and stay profitable. He goes, that's why you're here. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, uh, I don't know if that answers your question, but 
Um, I, no, that, that, that describes an outlier right there. So that's that's of no use to anybody here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I prepare the board you're materials. To be, uh, you're to be commended yeah. for, well, for that. It's just a different, uh, every, every, as everyone on the panel has talked about, every COO or CFO or VP ops, it's a different, it, it, it's really dependent on the size of the opportunity and I think the nature and the focus of the CEO. Mm -hmm. So. Um, one of the things that we were also talking about the other the other day on the phone, uh, Rob, you mentioned, uh, and and Brian, you alluded to this too. You know, somebody calls you up and you find out you're uh, you're doing business globally uh, in Australia. Have have either of you or any of the panelists found some unique challenges in in operating? Uh, you know, obviously one of the things is is clearly the inconvenience of dealing with people in different time zones, particularly extremely different time zones. Uh, but w were there some other challenges that were? Uh, particularly difficult, or those you didn't expect, or I can talk about. That. I mean, so I, it, you know, I think it's a, it's all about your relationship with the CEO. Um, you know, there's definitely there's definitely decision points in a company, particularly when you're growing quickly, that come seemingly overnight. And so, just like you wake up and say, like, we're oh my god, we're you know, we're in five countries. Um, you know, those, those kinds of things happen often. And so it's about understanding, one, I think having an understanding of where those decisions are being made. So even if you can come up with 50 reasons why it's totally nuts to do that, um, but understanding, understanding why, you know, this might be an important swing for the business and working as a partner to execute that. And I think that is, I think what, that's one of the biggest challenges as, not being the ultimate decision maker as a CEO. Um, and, you know, and that, I think, you know, I, in the few roles that I've had, there have been three distinct different genres of that. Um, you know, I did come into my first role as chief adults, like, no question. And, um, you know, and that had its own set of challenges. Um, the next role, you know, when you think about like preparing the board package, I only needed to prepare a couple bullets. Like, you know, I, I basically didn't have to do anything. You know, I went from running the board meeting to, you know, sending bullets. And, and you know, so I think that's the, the sort of, I think balancing that is important. Uh, and, and again, this was directed to the panel generally. And by the way, I'm happy to entertain questions from the audience if people have them. Um, Ask and you shall receive. Sure, yeah, okay. we'd we'll love to hear. Hi, everybody. My name is Alyssa Cohen. I'm an executive <coughs> and I'm so interested in folks in your role talking about culture and I think some extent values. And I'd love to hear just from some of you folks who were successful, Rob, maybe you, in inculcating culture. How did you go through like a values clarification process that really worked as opposed to it was just, you know, fluff? And then how do you really maintain culture? substantially, which is not just one. I'd love to use some details about that. Sure, I'll, I'll start. I'm sure everyone on the panel sure, just for, for benefit of um, just our live stream. Um, the question from the audience was uh, just related to culture. How do you inculcate it? How do you keep it going? Sure, uh, I, I, I can uh, I claim only uh, 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 secondary credit, I guess. So my founder, CEO, uh, started the company on a very specific premise, not only that there was a massive amount of white space and a $600 billion industry that needed to be transformed, but that he'd done it before. And if he was going to start another company, he was going to uh, uh, start it of, with a very specific set of cultural values. And he would rather crash and burn uh, doing it his way uh, uh, than doing it the way they say you should do it in business school or, uh, or, or a venture capitalist or anybody else tells you how to do it. He's going to do it his way. It's going to be a place that uh, 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 emanates his values and, and is a high character, high integrity person. Uh, and uh, one of the biggest things, and I would advocate this for everyone in the room, a little off topic for a second, uh, if you're going to ever get in the place where you hire a COO, a CFO, uh, spend a lot of time with them. The most important hire, that COO hire, there's got to be a massive, massive, massive amount of trust between the CEO and the COO. And you got to figure that out if you can trust them. Do you see the world the same way? Do you have the same values? When you think about scaling a business, is it the, is, are they the right kind of people? Uh, uh, if you guys don't agree on that, and I mean deeply, not sort of on the surface, oh yeah, business would suggest we do this, uh, you're gonna get out, you're, there's a higher likelihood you'll get out of alignment. 
So Jeff and I went through all that for two or three months. And it, yeah, some of it was about business, some of it was about where's the industry going, uh, what do we think the right strategic decisions are. Uh, but it was really most of it after all that was, hey, how do you think about the world? What are your values? W what do you look for in employees? What kind of leader are you? What kind of business do you want to run? So I would say, uh, uh, hopefully, humbly, uh, we try to live the values uh, 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 that we think are important. We talk about them pretty much every day. Uh, uh, well, I, I, uh, I'll give a few away, but uh, uh, you know, we look for uh, uh, people with specific traits, uh, specific personality, uh, 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 um, uh, characteristics. characteristics, thank you. Um, uh, but w we talk about uh, thrift, so being thrifty, which is not being cheap, uh, it's about making smart bets. So our entire culture is based on, hey, the one thing we all have limits on is our time, right? And so smart bets is not just how you spend money, but it's which clients you talk to and how much time you spend with them. and. Which ones do I think I can grow? Which ones are the most value to, to my portfolio and to, and to our business? Uh, we talk about, this is personal. Uh, everyone in, in our company, everyone in all of the companies in this room, talented people, they can go anywhere. People in my company can join your company, your company, they can go, they have choices. So we gotta make this a place they love to come to work. We gotta make this personal. They spend more time at work, 12, 10, 12 hours a day, than they do with their families. Like that's the definition of personal. If you don't want to be here, if you don't love uh, uh, the things that we're about, things that we value, generosity, sharing, teamwork, uh, uh, we won't hire people. We, we always talk about, you know, there's the, there's the, the Harvard MBA with the, the, you know, A++++ resume. But we've got to know no assholes. We don't hire assholes, right? Sorry for the live stream. Uh, so the you know the the person with a hundred score and everything, but it doesn't seems like a jerk. We'll take the person with a ninety, but is just a perfect cultural fit, a better team player, uh, more generous, all those things. So we, we've got a very well defined uh, uh, culture, which I, I'll I'll keep somewhat close to the vest because we think it works very well. Um, but we've had less than ten people ever leave our company. Uh, in five years. And, and so we think it works. And sometimes I say jokingly uh, that maybe we're a cult, <laughs> uh, but we know the kind of people that, that we like and that we relate to very well, and we know how to find them. And I think that's part of the reason anyway. So. Where do you find them? It's super hard. I, I, I'm, an, I'm an ad tech. We're a, a, a buyer's platform, a DSP. So the one thing I would share on that is, you know, there are other ad tech companies. We mostly not hired from them. Uh, we've got a role that we call trader, media traders, uh, that didn't exist in the world uh, five years ago. So we've we pulled ten people now off of Wall Street. So commodities traders. Uh, 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 other kind of traders and said, hey, you're in a dying or flat industry. You're not, every trading strategy that's ever going to be come up with, it's already been invented. Y yeah, you'll make a lot of money maybe, but you're not going to do anything new. Come over here. You can be the best trader in the world or one of the best. You can help us transform an industry. And this is an industry that's got a 20 year runway of transformation. You want to build a career and make a bet on yourself? This is a good industry to do it. So th that's one example. I've talked too much. <laughs> That's great. Thank you for that question. If there was one thing that, one skill that you, you'd be looking for if you were a CEO, um, or one background uh, that you'd look for in someone, and then for this case, we'll, you know, we'll say a COO, not a CFO, because we always say, well, finance and accounting background, both together if you could get it. But um, you, what would you be looking for in a C, COO? Or and I, I would ask each to answer that one in turn. Um, and and I and this can be very particular too if you were hiring it for news cred or trade desk or spring or you know digital ocean. It can be very particular to just to who you are or the culture of your company or the business of your company or the type of business. But I'd be interested to hear that. Which way um, we start? I can start. I can start. Yeah, I can start. I think um, I can, for, for news cred, it's interesting, um, we don't have a COO. And uh, we've certainly, as an um, executive team, we've talked about uh, the position, you know, COO or president or some um, or some, someone like that. And I think we just haven't been ready to, or and, and also haven't found that that perfect fit that's complementary to the executive team. But in terms of who we're looking for, I, um, I agree with Rob that, like, cultural fit is chiefly important because... Um, you know, by the time you grow at any stage, like uh, trust among exec team is the most vital because that 
also disseminates to the entire rest of the company. And at that point, you know, your CEO may not even know the names of everyone in the company anymore. And you have to trust every level of manager to, um, to you know, disseminate that. And so cultural fit and also, like, you know, for, for news credit, you know, we're a SaaS company. And so um, for a COO, like having a very deep knowledge of, of SaaS is super important to us um, because they have to understand the business very um, like naturally in terms of like the different drivers of the business, the different pitfalls, the different like levers and the ways that we can actually, you know, get, you know, accelerate our, our ROI on, on every dollar spent. And so um, as CEO, they would essentially oversee a lot of those types of decisions. And so that's also pretty important to us. So I think, you know, cultural fits, um, very strong command of, of, of metrics and levers and drivers and background in, in SaaS for us. I'll maybe take a more general approach to it is uh, if you're looking for that kind of person, somebody has probably run cross-functional teams because a CEO is going to have uh, touch every part of the business or a lot of it uh, or partner with a, a peer, uh, someone who's pr uh, driven, uh, proven business results. So you want someone ideally with a track record, regardless of where they've come from. Uh, I think, as Amy said, like industry experience uh, or orientation around the business model that you have. I think that's super important. Uh, uh, and then I'd say, um, uh, hey, analytical ability, financial ability, that, that can be really important, but I don't think it's necessary. It's not required, but it's definitely, I think everyone on the panel would say they're pretty numerate and pretty analytical. So I think that's a, an advantage, but not always required. So, sure. Um, I mean, those are pretty, it's a pretty good description. Um, I think I would add the demonstrated ability to solve problems and... Yeah. And I, you know, I think that's just, it's not just the same problems over and over again, but being able to take the, the, what they've learned in the past and apply, because most of this time you're sort of creating something completely new. Um, and the ability to um, manage and train people. So I think making sure that you spend some time doing background checks, not only for people that they've reported to, but the people that report to them. So understanding how you know they they were as a manager. So I am a CFO. In most companies, I've been CFO, COO, but I never took the COO title. Just to make it clear, but I think at the end of the day, to me, it's pretty simple. You're going to hire someone. They have to have a proven track record in making things happen. God only knows what those things are going to be. They're going to be different every single day. But can you look at that person? And can you trust that they're going to be your partner and can they make significant things happen? And the list is, I could go through a long list. And oftentimes it's, it's different in every company. Yeah, it's, it's not always the things you would think it would be, but it's managing processes and people. And An example, we negotiate, I was the CFO of Segway. We negotiated a major deal with General Motors during some tough times, and it was a joint development agreement, which was a cost plus arrangement, plus it was an equity investment. And we were dealing with the CEO, the CFO, the CTO of General Motors. Who was gonna negotiate the deal with General Motors? I said, I'll do it. Um, and it's, and it, it, I negotiated with a Fortune 500 before? No, but it's just having, the belief that you can figure out what you need to do and making sure you communicate with everyone about what you're doing. Talk to your entire management team because everyone is affected. Make sure your board's aware, but ultimately it's making things happen and trusting that the person, that person um, is gonna do the right thing. And if you can't, if you have to think about what the right thing is, it's probably not the right thing. We, we have some of the tangent questions. So we talk, you guys have talked to us about hiring, how you hire yourself in many ways. As you grow the structure from 10 to 20, 20 to 50, 50 to 100, 100 to 200, 300 people, uh, especially in a tech business, how do you balance hiring engineers versus sales versus marketing versus ops versus product versus customer support? How do you, do you is there a, do you have kind of a rule of thumb of how you scale these functions? Is it very dependent on the product, the market, et cetera? 
Uh, I can start with that. I'm sure everyone has very different approaches to it. Um, so you're talking about essentially budgeting, because you know every company annually at least goes through a budgeting process as part of that. Essentially, um, this. Uh, Decides, you know, what what the hiring plan is going to be for the for the next twelve months, um, and obviously that gets adjusted as you know business conditions change, uh, for the better or worse. Um, and so um, for for news crowd for for myself, um, it's a combination of um, what it always starts with. What are, what are you trying to accomplish, you know, in the next. 12 months and also for the next three years, I would say, have some idea of like, where are you trying to get to? And a lot of it for us, it's, um, it's actually product oriented in terms of like figuring out like, where is this market going? And then so, okay, so mar- we so our point of view is market's going here. And so we need to build, uh, these are the things that we need to build over the next, again, like 12 to 36 months. And then once that happens, once you kind of lock that idea down, then it's around, um, Okay, then that means we need to, you know, this is our engineering capacity. Um, and because you've been, you know, ideally you've been working with your CTO around like what's, you know, what what is the capacity for efficiency of the engineers? So then we need to hire these many engineers. And then, you know, and then we think that this market will allow us to grow X percent. And then you build your sales plan from like kind of like rep by rep productivity basis and then and then so like how much of your sales are you going to make via from you know direct so like marketing um, sales outbound versus marketing outbound which then um, helps you with with uh, with your marketing budget so there every team is very inter intertwined and every company has a different sort of like um, ratio for what is ideal to them and then, and then at the end of the day I always do a top down um, look as well in terms of like, I, I look at um, a panel of like public companies our com set when they were our size what were they spending from like a sales and marketing as a percentage of sales R&D as a percentage of sales to then look top down like um, and be like okay I built it from bottoms up is this efficient if I were like an outside investor looking at our financials and kind of like checking both ways One of the biggest struggles on um, CEOs face in early stage companies is balancing internal ops with the best HR and external go market strategy. What key advice or points do you have where you want you to transition and balance that? And or what companies have you seen um, where a CEO was able to balance that effectively? Because that's pretty much the biggest problem that we face as a early growth company is balancing our internal and external complexity of the vision. So I think I think the two questions are, are in a way somewhat related, and it's interesting that every company has priorities, and some companies it, it gets to be if you're a December year end, all of a sudden the CEO goes, "Oh, we, we need to have a budget. We got to we've got to go give a budget to the board." And they go run into the CFO and go, "Just tell everyone to do their budget," and it's like, "Oh my God, what are we doing?" Because if you go to every person and you just tell them, do a budget. Everyone's gonna come in, and you're gonna get such a long list of demands that you might as well start, you just can't do it. You'll never get there. And if people don't have a common understanding of what you're trying to achieve, and if you can't prioritize against that, then the team is not going to gel as a team. They're not gonna agree on what needs to be done. They're not gonna agree on who should be hired. They're not gonna agree on how you should price your product. They're not gonna agree on what should be the revenue or bookings targets be, and it's a free for all. And the most important thing is to make sure you get together as a team and start without numbers and just talk about what are we trying to achieve over the next 12 months. And once you have a common understanding and you put those Um, right up on the board and everyone agrees you rank them this is number one this is number two and then you start getting into allocation of resources and strategies you ultimately go back to what you as a team decided the priorities were and if you fund and build your company based upon the priorities I think you've got a much better chance of getting there as opposed to everyone works in a siloed manner they don't communicate with each other and then when something doesn't go right guess what, everyone's pointing the finger at someone else because they didn't do their job, when maybe you didn't give that person the resources that they needed. Well, that's real leadership to actually get a leadership team together to, you know, to figure out what those priorities are and, and to you know, tie them directly to, to the operating units of the business. Uh, we, we had another question in the back. I was wondering, as operators, how do you decide which butterflies to follow? Which one? Which what? Uh, which butterfly? Which 
butterfly to follow. All right, yeah, so we're, we're going back to my uh, CEOs, whatever you want yeah, to call yeah. them, the butterflies. Yeah, yeah. How, do you, how do you, as operators, decide like which butterfly to follow and invest, most importantly, your timing? That's a good point because, I mean, every, everyone here has actually got a bit of an origin story about how they wound up at these unbelievably, you know, but, in 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 hindsight, the, these are kind of obvious places you'd want to be. Spring just raised a big round. That's yeah. that's that was a big credentialing thing, and you you picked it a while ago. You made a bet on it, right, Brian? I mean, you know, DigitalOcean, same thing. You haven't been there very long, but that's it, you know that one might have been an easy one. You know, two and a half years ago, the trade desk was cool, but it, no one knew it would be this. And the same thing, you know, for NewsCred. I mean, these are these are winning companies. Mm -hmm. So. I didn't, know, I didn't know if the question was, how did you pick these companies or how do you prioritize once you're in the companies? <laughs> Why did you, each of you individually decide to go and work with these buyers? I, I thought it was. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay, got it, got it. Why did you buy the vision? It's yeah, free. so I mean, I can, I can walk through all three of them. So, um, you know, with Etsy, you know, I... I had, I had started my career as an investment banker. I went to business school. I came out. I was a, a management consultant. I knew I wanted to come. Um, I wanted to go on the early stage side. Oh, I forgot. I was a venture. I worked in venture too, um, and I was a big uh, management consulting firm. And I knew I wanted to do early stage, but you know, at that time, no one really was interested in talking to an ex banker VC um, consultant. And, um, you know, I was fortunate. I had, you know, my old boss and mentor, Fred Wilson, was just about to put his the, fir the first institutional round into Etsy. But it was still pretty risky. I mean, like, you know, venture capitalists, what, you know, have eight companies that don't work for their, you know, two that work. So, um, you know, I had to make a real big decision about leaving my safe, like, cocoon to go and do something that seemed, at particularly at the time I went in 2007, like, totally crazy. And, um, you know, one, I, I spent a month doing due diligence. I, um, I spent a bunch of time with the CEO and I just went to like literally went to, I think, 15 craft fairs to really understand how the market was working today and talking to sellers and seeing like what they saw was the vision. And, you know, within a couple of weeks, I realized, wait, there is something here. Like whether I, I thought it was more execution risk than opportunity. Um, and then from the fit of this was a great transition to go um, onto the operating side. That was like, you know, sort of the two pieces that fit together. Now I went, my next transition was arguably less, um, a less successful company, but we had a, you know, sort of great rise and, a, you know, a bit of a fall. Um, but the, the core reason why I went there was not because I thought like, the design market was so amazing, but it was that it was actually the product roadmap. And so I really believed that we were going to be able to change the way people shop. And so um, and it was about the the path, the path of product development and um, our, the roadmap and the the swiftness of experimentation. And you think about, you know, e-commerce and I didn't really consider Etsy e-commerce. I mean, it's obviously e-commerce, but like it's marketplace versus um, a traditional retailer. Um, you know, we're still really in the first inning of uh, development there. So I was like, all right. And so, you know, we started to raise a bunch of capital. And like, as we did that, our eye went off of the creative side of like how we're going to change the way we did things to, wow, we have to drive top line. And so that was sort of the change there. And with Spring, it was, you know, sort of the same the sort of the same thesis is like okay, you know we know we know um, we know that um, commerce is moving to mobile. We know that you know malls are dying, but people still need to aggregate that demand. And there was an opportunity. There was an opportunity there. And this is you know I joined you know eight eight months before launch, um, but there was some you know there was something there, and it was an opportunity to really understand and build upon the things that I learned in my previous companies that had mobile, um, and how can we move the envelope there? So that's how I that's how I thought about those those decisions. So I don't know if that's helpful. If you had to use one word to describe uh, the most attractive thing to, of of the butterfly that you decided to follow or capture, or whatever the analogy is, 
Um, what would that one word be, one word that sums up the characteristic of the CEO that you decided to follow? I have a, a good story about that, actually. So I think the, the one, one word. The one, okay, all right. My one word was um, sincerity. Uh, and uh, there's a lot, I think, a lot behind it. But um, I'll tell you a story of how I ended up at NewsCred. And I think, I mean, it's a little, I think, ultimately, I think a lot of people followed where we felt like we really connected with the CEO and founder. And for me, it was 100%. Um, because of that. So I, at the time I was at I Ventures, I was on the VC side, and um, I kind of have decided at that point that I was really interested in working at growth stage rather than like early stage. And so at that time, you know, I was like, look, I was talking with, you know, NewsCred, Digital Ocean, like a couple of other companies. And then also my first fund, Insight, which is much later stage fund, um, you know, they offered me a great position to come back. Um, and I was really pumped to do it, actually. Um, and so at the time, I had been working for a couple of months with NewsCred, just doing some consulting work. And um, and so I, I went in with uh, and to, to tell Shafkat um, Islam that, you know, I was going to go take a full-time offer at my um, at my first fund. Um, and, uh, and he literally looks at me and he was like, um, at the time, the, the company had just raised another round of funding, but there was one strategic investor that they were hoping to get that kind of fell through. And he was like, I, um, you know, I was really devastated when that investor fell through, but I, I am so much more devastated that you're about to not work at NewsCred. And he was like, I'm going to make this the best life decision and career decisions you've ever made in your life if you come like work here. And I um, and honestly, I heard that. I'd already given my verbal acceptance to the, the other fund, but I was like, I can't not work for someone who honestly believes more in me at the time than my, I did in myself. And so that sincerity was like what drove me or what drew me to the butterfly. And honestly, I think that will follow me the rest of my career. So it's really important for me. I, I can't do it in one word, but I can do it in maybe four phrases. So strategic clarity, uh, high integrity, uh, credibility uh, of the butterfly, uh, and we had a common vision. So I, I think those four things um, came together. Surely there's a single word that captures <laughs> I can't. <laughs> I mean, we just tip my tongue. <laughs> I would say visionary, but I think those four would probably be the better four the, as a, a screening criteria. Because <laughs> there's lots of visionaries. Yes, right? exactly. <laughs> but sometimes they're mirage. I'd love to give you one, but I'll give you two. One is passionate because you've got to be selling. If I don't believe you, then is anyone else going to believe you? You sell to everyone every single day. And the other is partner. Do you really want a partner? And just because your board tells you you'd want a partner, do you really believe you need a partner? And my attitude is from a partnership perspective, and I will ask a CEO, is there anything you would ever feel uncomfortable telling me? And vice versa. And if they, you know, if they pause or the body language isn't positive, it's, it's not worth it. So anything that's going on, they should feel comfortable talking about. And sometimes things aren't always cheery and positive, but you, you have to have the ability to sit down and talk about it. In your career, as, as you guys have found and, and been working with entrepreneurs, was there um, someone you really wanted to work with and, and it didn't work out for whatever reason? And what was that process like? like how did you bounce back from that and continue on? So is this after? From a hiring perspective? or no, from you going after the Butterfly. So after you already... I didn't mean for this to be such a durable uh, metaphor. <laughs> I'm a believer in fate. The right thing is going to happen. If someone doesn't want to hire me, so what? You know how many other jobs there are? It's meant to be. So if you don't get the job, move on to the next one. Yeah, I think especially in this like early to mid stage company situation, there's you could talk yourself out of pretty much anything. I mean, there's just so much risk, right? So I think that's the piece. I mean, it's obviously always disappointing, but there's, there's a lot of other things to do. I agree. Yeah, I, I, I don't think that. I think that's a great, great summary. Okay, and I have one last question because I guess it's my prerogative, uh, and this one's directed to you, Brian. How do you like New York so far? 
If I said anything other than I love it, I'd get trampled on it. Going out the door. In this room, Quite honestly, know. I do love it. And I'll, and the reason I love it, I didn't really know what the New York tech scene was like. I knew the company I was joining, but the tech scene here is very vibrant. And it's, it's a very, obviously a very vibrant city, but in a very short period of time, I've met so many people and everyone's been very engaging. Everyone's been very welcoming. And building great companies isn't easy. And to the extent we can all support one another and share ideas and things of that nature, I think it's great. So no one's, um, no one's abused me yet for being from uh, Patriot land and, um, and I'm happy to be here. Great. Uh, and I thank you for being here and, and each of you. Uh, this was so, uh, very kind of you and generous to do this and as as you say brian to to share insights with with people here um both on the panel and just uh, in, in the networking it uh serves a great function we're glad to be a part of it and, and thrilled that you you all made time to do it and uh, for everybody else here thanks for coming very much appreciate it